morning, Verna. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Baird. Beautiful and hot being on Guam. Good morning, Verna. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Baird. Thank you for having me today. Yes. Um, everybody who's listening, I'm on Guam and I have Verna. She was a colleague of mine at the University of Guam and she's a poet and many things. So I'm interested in one of her poems and it's called Duendes, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm interested because of the cultural similarities, and I want to learn something from you about it. What's this poem about, really? What are duendes? Do you call one duende or all of them are duendes? Uh, we just refer to them just duendes, right? Okay, so right. even if it's one duendes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so, so in writing the poem, um, I was thinking a lot about uh, my family immigrated here to Guam from the Philippines. Um, and just thinking about the similarities too of, of the cultures, um, that there are duendes here on Guam too, right? The Chamorro legends also talk about duendes, which are uh, these spirits, um, usually in the form of uh, these smaller people, right? That are likened to um, elves or even goblins. Um, and depending on your interactions with them, they can be benevolent, right? If, especially if they like you. And, and, you know, a lot of people say that they're drawn to children. Yeah. Um, but if you offend them or, um, you know, uh, they, they don't like you, then they can cause uh, trouble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, like I asked earlier, how do you encounter doing this? I don't know I've encountered any, but I don't know. Because... You know, I'm not, I'm not fully aware of all the things about them, but I have some consciousness about other, the other life or other entities. So mm -hmm. you go outside and you encounter them. How do children get into contact with them or they get in contact with children? So it's, it's usually um, in very... Uh, jungle areas, wooded areas. Um, you know, I remember my grandfather telling me that um, if you're out in the jungle and you see these mounds of, of dirt, right, that, that usually that's where duendes live and you don't want to disturb it, right? You don't want to step on it. You don't want to kick it. Um, but just in general, you, you never know, right, in a jungle area where uh, a duendes is living or if a duendes is there and you just, you just can't see it. So this mound, is it three feet high, three inches high? What, what's the height of this mound? Um, you know, I was never really told, but, but they said it's, it's a mound of dirt. And, and it just, when you see it, like, you know that, okay, that, that's, that's not, it, it's not a man-made creation. That, that was something built there um, by an entity that you just, you want to respect its space, right? It, it, it's home. So if somebody disturbs this mound, what happens to them? Uh, <laughs> a lot of things. Um, you know, the, it's a variation. You you end up with bruises, like uh, like some someone or something pinched you. Um, right. I've heard stories of of people, uh, you know, peeing in the jungle and they're not they're not conscious of of where they're peeing, right, or, or asking yes. permission or, or showing. And so you know, it'll be things like. Um, you may have a rash that comes up in a place that you wouldn't want a rash in, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it really depends. And, um, yeah. you know, you we were talking earlier about, about um, interactions with people, uh, you know, that the rich, rich people yes. tend to have one this, right? Um, I, I've also had stories of, of um, I've also heard stories of, of people where as young children, a duendes took a liking to them. Oh. Um, and the duendes becomes almost like a protector oh. um, of the child. Um, and so I had, I had a neighbor a few years ago, um, you know, and the story was that as a child, there was a duendes that took a liking to her. Mm -hmm. And so she, weird, weird things that, that 
her family couldn't explain what happened. So uh, there was a wardrobe that fell on top of her and mm. she came out completely unharmed, yeah. right? The one just protected her. Um, she would cook rice when it was her time to cook rice for the family. Her mm. rice would last a lot longer than everyone else's. It's like, uh, no matter how much they were, were scooping the rice and using the rice, it just seemed like the rice wouldn't, wouldn't go empty um, yeah and and they were saying oh it's it's her duendes friend um and it, it followed her from when she was in the philippines and she immigrated here to to guam um they she believed that it followed her wow. um, uh, and i i've had an experience with her specifically we we uh we had a sleepover and i was sleeping um at the bottom of her bed and she was sleeping on her bed and in the middle of the night uh, I felt something impact on my chest mm -hmm. very suddenly just out of nowhere and I woke up and feeling like something hit my chest mm -hmm. and and they were saying oh it might have it might have been her duendes friend yes. jumping off the bed and, and onto you mm. so, so, yeah. you know I'm glad you brought that up because we have stories of entities that we call it like for example Baku Baku is a short in individual or a short entity, short and ugly and can be very mischievous, malevolent, as you say, or good. And you have to feed it bananas and milk. Rich people are suspected to have Baku. And I could uh, itemize names of people in the village who they said had Baku. And if you didn't treat your Baku right, they would run away. Or if you feed somebody's Baku, banana and milk, they might leave you and come if I feed the thing, they might come to me and it's supposed to bring riches. Um, in all of this, I've always wondered when people migrate from their homelands with these stories, how do they travel to other places? And you answer that for me that this girl, it is said, she, her duendes followed her. That's interesting because I've always wondered about her Baku and Olaig and Jombi and all these other entities that are supposed to be spiritual or whatever or in the other world i always wonder if when you leave your homeland they stay there you see what i'm mm -hmm. saying because if you have a belief system that includes them how do you become this new person in this other land where supposedly they don't exist or do they exist so that's a good answer yeah i don't know of anybody's back who following them to the united states <laughs> you know, yeah. So this poem that you wrote, can you read it? Because I want to like unpack certain things that you're saying. Okay. So this poem um, was published in 2016. So it's it's a it's been a while. Uh, Duendes. Every other weekend. We throw old papaya skins and moldy bananas into the boonies behind our house as feed for stray chickens and fertilizer for the coconut trees. And every other weekend, Enang reminds us to call out, buddy buddy apo, into the thick overgrowth to warn the duendes living there to watch their heads for our falling fruit. We laugh at her and her old world superstitions brought back from the boonies of the Philippines to our backyard boonies in Guam where the duendes surely converse in Chamorro tongues instead of Ilocano ones. So there is no need, we tell Inang, to toss our pardons to tiny elves who would not understand us anyway. But it is Inang's turn to laugh. She is amused at our ignorance of not realizing that respect is a language all on its own. Very good. I love it, I love it, I love it. So it begins with every other weekend, something that you do normally, right? You're throwing the skins to the, to the outside, for the, supposedly for the chickens and the, 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 to fertilize coconut trees. But she, your Inang, it, what does Inang mean? Uh, that's my grandmother. Inang, grandmother, or mother figure, right? In, in yeah. your culture. And mm -hmm. Inang is telling you, bari bari apo. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What is she saying? 
Um, so it's it's almost like a warning. Um, it's 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 you telling the spirits, whether it's duendes or even something else, right? That you know, uh, watch you know, watch yourself. Like I'm, you know, excuse me, I'm 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 stepping into your area. I'm 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 affecting where you are, right. um, and there are variations. So it's it's interesting because um, a lot of people who read this poem who are Filipino, uh, they also were like, I've never heard of bari bari ako. You know, we use something different. We say kayo kayo, or we say uh-huh. tabi tabi. Mm-hmm. Um, so there there are variations, but it all really means the same thing. It's you know, excuse me, I'm I'm here. Yes. I, I really like that because I'm going to show you the comparison to my culture now. There was one time I was telling my friend because I really admired indigenous cultures and all of that and the customs and practices. I, I have told the story before, which is part of my telling of, of rhetorics, that my chair took me to a conference once and I was with her chair and her friends. I was just a grad student and she's an indigenous scholar and she took they took me to the water. It was like a practice of theirs wherever they go in the United States because they say that every university is built on native land. Mm-hmm. Every university in the United States. That's so powerful. And so they would find the water in those places where the conferences are held, whether it's four seas or whatever. They would find the water and they would lay down tobacco as a way to pay homage to their, their, their kin and their indigenous uh, fellows. And I was so uh, in, uh, in awe of that. And for them to let me into that, you know, I felt so grateful. But what it did for me, it made me question my culture. So I thought to myself, you know, I got culture greedy, culture envy. I was so envious. Oh my gosh, they have such nice thing. I don't have this nice thing to do. And I was complaining to one, to one of my participants in my research. And I said, Cheryl, you know, we don't have this nice thing. She said, Pauline, we got things like that. I said, no, 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 we don't have nothing like that. She said, stop. When your grandmother opened the cow mouth, well, I got to explain cow mouth to you. Imagine a wooden house in the Philippines, right? And it has a window attached. And you can take a, the window, the window cover is wood and you can push it out. It has heat, mm-hmm. um, inch, you know, you would know that. The inch, yeah. you put the stick and you poke it there and it stick out. Yes. Now, outside of that window is a sink and that's where you wash the dishes right mm-hmm. and sometimes it's enclosed and we call it a cow mount so sometimes you can when you finish washing the dishes you would throw out the water we would throw skins out there because we have a garbage dump outside you throw skins you throw whatever you throw the dirty water right there most country houses used to have a, a garbage dump right mm-hmm. so she said when your grandmother get the dirty water and she throw the dirty water. What should I say? I say, should I say, wait the family? Family means family. Wait their family. Watch out family. She mm-hmm. said, who your grandmother talking to? I say, but you know, <laughs> you're right. She ain't talking to just, maybe she's talking to humans because back in the day, sometimes people would walk through other people's property and you don't want to be throwing out dirty water on them. But mm-hmm. In implicitly or intuitively, I kind of understood what the culture was about. Even was never told to me that the ones who've passed on live with us and they might be under the coconut tree where you're throwing this water. So you've got to give them the heads up, wait the family so they can move before you throw this thing. And right. I thought, oh my gosh, when I read the skins, I'm like, mm, Bernays, my people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah yeah it's it's and it's funny you mentioned throwing out water specifically because that's my my grandmother has passed it's, it's been a few yes. years but i i still find myself you know when i'm i'm out like in the garden right or, or if I'm, I'm changing our dog's water and i'm tossing the water out into a grassy area i don't even think about it i'm, I'm yelling at you know uh, buddy, buddy, apple. And mm-hmm. I'm thinking, my goodness, what, you know, the types of things that follow you. And it's not, yes. mm-hmm. you know, it, my grandmother never sat me down and said, you need to do this, yes. right? It was watching her do that. It was asking, why are you doing that? It was following, you know, those, those customs and, and still kind of continuing it on today. And, yeah. You know. And it's like, um, 
I often ask, how do we make these stories visible? Mm -hmm. And in a way, it's not a fair question because these stories, it's, it's a presupposition that it's in, they're invisible. They're not invisible. They're practiced. But mm -hmm. how do we make them visible to ourselves? Because they've always been there. And mm -hmm. we know them. We carry, I, I say, we carry them in our bodies. It's the rhetoric mm -hmm. of the body. We carry them in our body. And then we unlock them at certain times. When we put a conscious thinking of them. When we do the meta, 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 the meta cognitive. How come we come by this? That's why we end up making this map to our um, ancestors. You said that. But yesterday I was digging a hole. My neighbor gave me, <laughs> my neighbor gave me, uh, an avocado. Mm -hmm. I wasn't even here. She's telling me in Japan that this avocado she's giving me to plant in my yard. I don't even understand what that's about. But anyway, she's going to tell me what I'm planting my yard and she's going to put, she's going to give it to me. So I came home and the avocado is there and I'm thinking, where am I going to plant this dried avocado? The soil hard, hard. I, I, I start punching holes. And every time I dig the hole, I'm thinking, I have to be careful with holes. That if I don't use this hole, I have to cover back this hole. Because in our culture, it's just only holes. Mm -hmm. they, they have meaning, you know? Why are you digging holes? You just can't dig holes like that. They have broader meaning. So it's always at the back of my head. And then this whole duendes thing that I learned about, but I didn't know about the duendes. I knew about the tatamona, mm -hmm. something different. So I'm thinking, it, what I learned is that when you come to Guam, you just don't go in the bush like that because the tatamona might be in there, might pinch you. Mm -hmm. And so I have the respect for the bush. And I think in my culture, we have a respect for the bush in, or, or forestry in a different kind of way that you don't pick um, fruit off the trees after six o'clock. Mm -hmm. You know, six o'clock, you can't go touching trees and picking fruit and that kind of stuff. And the thieves do it anyway. The thieves do it, but regular people <laughs> don't do that. And I've always wondered, they would tell you, if you ask them, well, why can't you pick the tree, pick something from the tree or climb the tree? They would say, oh, you want to know? Okay, you go. Since you want to know, you go. And I always felt that if you went up a tree after six, something would make you fall down. Or something will happen to you. So I never really tried it. So I live across from the wetlands. And anytime I have to go into that bush, like the other day, I thought, we thought the cat was missing. I'm thinking, I'm not going in that bush. Oh no, nighttime. So I call my neighbor, Mel, come. The cat might be in the bush. So she get a flashlight. And she's telling me, Paul, tomorrow when it's daytime, we're going to go in and look. I'm like, mm hmm. I'm not going in there by myself. You have to go with me so we could say, oh, excuse me. <laughs> you know, before I enter the bush. So that's a really interesting cross-cultural um, thing. Yeah. So what's your next stanza, if you don't have anything to say about that one? Um, take a look at that, yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, in the poem, it's, it's, you know, my grandmother reminding us, you know, call this out. And, and it's this back and forth. This was really based on a conversation that we had, like, okay, why are we speaking? We're on Guam, right? Mm -hmm. and, and here in Guam, uh, they also have the duendes, right? This is right. something that part of their legends, part of their lore as well, that, that there are these small uh, human-like figures that live out in jungle areas that, that you need to also be careful of. And so, so the joke was, why are we going to be speaking them in, to, with our language if they are speaking Chamara? What is this, you know? Yes. They're not going to understand <laughs> Ilocano. They're going to understand Chamara. And, you know, I, so, so that, that really was the, the basis of this, this poem of, so there's this shared, we, we have this shared idea in common, right? The, the idea of the duendes. Yeah. Um, so learning about the duendes on, on Guam is, isn't really different. Like, yes, we know that we, we have duendes yeah. in the Philippines, right? A lot of the same similarities. Um, so the point of contention there was really, why are we going to use the Ilocano yeah. phrase? They're not going to, uh, to understand this. They're going to understand whatever the Chamorro equivalent is. Uh -huh. um, 
And so it really came down to this idea of, of respect, right? That it, it doesn't really matter where you are, that you have to be aware that there are beings that are here first, right? That inhabit spaces and that you right. you are some stranger going into, into these beings, you know, their homes right. or... And so to, to show that respect. And so, you know, my, my grandma was so adamant about, nope, no matter what, I don't, I don't care if we're back in the province in the Philippines, if we're here, you, you show that respect. Right. And, you know, it, um, that speaks to this whole notion of material rhetorics and environmental rhetorics. Because when you read non-decolonized work or, or decolonized or colonized work, people, the settlers and so on, they would look at the piece of land and say, okay, land, fertile, let's go live, cut down trees, build this, build that, you know, it's prosperity, it's progress. But there are people who belong to that land, mm -hmm. who have certain practices, who have a relationship with the land, the land as mother. And when you said Inang, the double stick there was there, because at the end of it, you said it's a respect for nature, mother nature. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. imagine Mother Nature is saying you have to have certain kind of respect for the land, you know, mm -hmm. and, hope. and respect the land, be careful of the land, don't erode it, don't destroy it, don't handle it in certain kinds of ways. And here you have people who would come into lands and just do things. And it's a cautionary tale for us to understand that we can, if we understand the people who came before, we will understand how to respect this land. So we know that we don't cut down indiscriminately. When we have to say the, excuse me, we're paying homage to the people who have walked this land before. For some people, that's not important. But for our se sense of knowing and value and being, it's very important because it links us to the people who have come before, honor their work, and how we're going to proceed from here on out. So mm -hmm. that is so, so vital. And I love that. I love that. And I heard the sarcasm in your tone. Yeah. Young people say, what, what is this old lady saying at all? That was long, long time days, you know, it's whatever. But like you say, it's not the long time days, it's the respect. So for those who are listening to us and, and want to know why are we telling these stories of things gone before and other, it's about respect and, and um, how we situate ourselves now, tell us how we align ourselves with our past and maybe with our future. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't respect it, then any old person will come into your space, into your, your lands or your, your um, that's it, places and do whatever they want because you don't have rules, you don't have respect, you don't have anything, you know, and that's not good enough. Yeah. So that's pretty cool.